On this episode, we talk about how your mental capacity, parenting, and your attitude affect your performance. Welcome to another episode of Inside the League. I am your host, Joy Harris. I have with me today Mario Soto, who does all things baseball and performance. So I'm super excited to jump into this conversation. Thank you so much, Mario, for joining me today. Oh, Joy, it's a pleasure. Um, it's it, it's actually kind of weird because I'm normally on the other side, I'm normally in your chair interviewing people. So to have the roles reversed, it's 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 different. I like it. So I'll enjoy you being in the hot seat today. Uh, <laughs> tell everyone kind of how you got into the position you are today and a little bit about, about your background. So, um, boy, I'll try and give you the short and condensed version. I was a failed college athlete, um, had dreams and aspirations, and all of a sudden they didn't come true. Um, one was uh, to be a baseball player, and the very first day, first day of college practice, the ball is hit to me and it takes a really bad bounce, hits me in the eye, knocks me out. I'm in the dugout and I come to and I've got bruising, I've got a little fracture. And I was, I had a real tough time overcoming the fear of, of ground balls being hit to me. At the time, my gosh, almost 40 years later, I didn't realize there was this field of called sports psychology where there are professionals who could help athletes overcome traumas or fears or, or performance anxiety. Wow. And, and so there's this, there, there is these, these series of seminal moments that happened in my life that eventually led me to the discovery of this field, the discovery of our, uh, of a gentleman who is one of the tops in the field, a pioneer, and who eventually not only became my mentor, but talked me into getting into this crazy uh, field of sports psychology. And then fast forward almost 20 years, I am now literally doing what he um, was doing back in the day. I'm a professor at Cal Baptist University where I teach graduate students this, this craft of sports psychology. I work with a multitude of athletes and populations of sport. I just came back from, uh, as I was telling you earlier, from Florida. I was um, I, the, the guest of the Tampa Bay Rays. I got a chance to kind of take all that in. I was working with equestrian riders down in Florida. Um, this morning I had a phone call as early as 5.30 in the morning to work with a kid who's gonna be representing Team USA in what they call the Nations Cup. She's a top level dressage rider and eventually will be an Olympian. So I, I never went into this um, as an undergraduate thinking or having any clue about sports psychology, but I got lucky because I always knew I wanted to be different and I wanted to be really good at something. I wanted to be successful. And so those transferable skills are what I think, along with some divine intervention, yeah. put me into this position and and... I pinch myself every day because I truly believe I'm I'm so blessed to do what so few people get a chance to do and do it at a high level and do something I love doing. Kudos to you for taking what could have been a setback and actually turning it into something that gave you momentum and you yes. were able to turn it into a craft that now others can benefit from. So that's always amazing when somebody can extend their skills and their experiences to help others. Talk a little bit about performance. What are some key tips, best practices that athletes can use to enhance their performance and get over some of those mental hurdles? You know, confidence is fragile and it doesn't matter what type of uniform you're wearing, whether it's a suit and tie, whether it's a little league uniform or, or whether you're a professional, we all have these insecurities. Um, I, I'm, I'm flying back and in, in, and in between flights, I'm getting phone calls from a couple clients and these are pretty high level people, names uh, you know that I can't share because of confidentiality agreements. But let me just say that 
those calls would surprise most people because there are phone calls asking about, you know, I'm in a slump. How do I get out of it? I'm, I'm really struggling with what I'm doing. And you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, this person is making a living at this and they're really good. And they're calling me because they're, they're questioning their ability. So a one, we're human. Number two, we, no, no one steps into wanting to do something saying, hey, watch me. I can't wait for you to see me lay a big egg here and just be, be the worst that anyone's ever seen. We all have pride and we all want to do something well. I think sometimes our emotion gets ahead of us. Sometimes our ego gets ahead of us. Absolutely. And we need to dial things back. So we simplify what we're doing. And we don't make the moment larger than what it is. That could be parenting. It could be trying to have a better relationship with your partner. It could be being a better student in the classroom. It could be being, how do I become a better teacher today? Right. So if you can walk away with trying to simplify what you're doing, as opposed to overwhelming yourself because you don't, you're not meeting your own expectations, that take that tends to take a little bit of the pressure off of our shoulders. Because again, I think everyone wants to do well. Right. Sometimes we just kind of get lost or we trip over our own two feet because we're judging ourselves too harshly. And as I just sent the text out to a parent, we have to remind ourselves also of what our roles are. Right. I will tell you that I was not a great sport parent. And this field not only changed my life, it renewed my, um, oh God, my sense of understanding what our roles needed to be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, could have, would have, should have. We'd all wish we have a clock to go back, a time machine to go back, change things, but we can't. Right. We can change things today so that the future has a ripple effect, a positive one. And so we need to ask ourselves, sports parents, I hope you're hearing this. Are you really helping or are you part of the problem? Yes. Are you putting too much pressure on your kid? Because the sports are already designed to do that. Right. Life is already designed to do that. Right. There's an opponent designed in the sport, designed to create adversity. And if we always have someone whispering in our ear telling us what to do, we're not being present. And so one of the gifts that we can give our child is the space to grow, to fail, and to get feedback. It's, it's a teachable moment. Mm -hmm. Those are the seeds that will eventually allow little Billy or little Sally to become successful and get out of what sports is supposed to give them. But if we try and make it about, you got to get a scholarship and you got to make you, it. That's your, that's your dream and desire. And listen, I hope it happens, but you got to be careful what you ask for. Yes. Because yes. it's not easy. Yes. I totally think that piece about parenting being in the conversation of performance, because you don't often hear the two together. You hear yes. performance solely in the side of the athlete. And then parenting is somewhere in the um, Uber driving that has to happen to mm -hmm. and from mm -hmm. practice and camps and things. But I think that big piece of performance being a having the athlete learn how to kind of take the fear with them, right? Nobody is born knowing all the things. And so having a better relationship with fear, making it smaller, like you said, uh, just the task at hand. Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to not try to not be afraid. I'm just going to do the thing that I'm doing in the present moment. And then parents being more of the path clearer for yes. the athlete, rather than the luggage that the athlete has to carry. They, like you said, they already have their own set of, opponents and tryouts and teachers and coaches, yes. all that stuff is already happening as the bags that they have to carry with them. And so at least you can do is kind of go ahead of them and clear the hurdles, you know, have the other people on the other side back off, encourage them as much as possible. And, um, and I would even argue you don't have to clean it, clean the street where it's pristine. You want them to experience a speed bump. Right. Or learning how to be able to clear the path for themselves. Yes. Because again, that's how they learn how to manage adversity. Right. One of the biggest questions I have asked of me by parents or large organizations, how do we make our kids grittier? 
they're soft. Okay. The it's, it, it's a nature versus nurture conversation, but I think both play a very important role. Mm-hmm. If your kid is 15 and you're still doing their laundry, what's the message you're telling? Right. Okay. If you're constantly trying to make everything perfect and fix things, what is the message you're telling them? Right. In reality, parents, I know our intention is coming from a place of love. Problem is, it's not. You're handicapping your kid. And so, like all mentors, even, even though you're a parent, in a sense, you are a mentor. So if the parent themselves doesn't have grit, tenacity, mm. stick to itiveness, then preaching it and seeing it is two different things. Yes. And so, and, and so the parent also has to be self-aware. Like, hey, I may not have this tool or this characteristic no shade to the parent and nothing to be themselves about, but then you may need to stick your athlete around somebody who has it, who can teach them how to have it within the realm that they need. Which is We want to model the right behavior that we're hoping our children, because we're the strongest influence. Right. And, and as our, as a parent, you, if you're going to do your job right, you want to surround them. It takes a village. Yes. You want to surround them with the best mentors, not the best knuckleheads. So to this point, I have a young lady who I just started working with, and she's a perfectionist. I'm a truth teller. Mm -hmm. I am paid to tell you the truth. And I am willing to risk the relationship because of my position of integrity. Right. I value what I do, and I value the privilege and honor of working with people who are trusting me with their most precious resource, their children. Right. So I'm going to call people out. So I'm going to share a little bit of this text with you. Okay. Um, so I just said, hello, mom, just got a phone with your coach, your daughter's coach, um, to discuss how to best help your daughter. She's a perfectionist. And those types of kids tend to be hardest on themselves. One thing I want to ask of you, and I need for you to trust me, is to give her some space with respect to giving her feedback on how she does or what she could have done. We all do that. But what's the worst part of a kid's day? The drive home after a bad practice. <laughs> right. So I told her, I said, listen, she's already quite the competitor. And because she's so hard of her, on herself trying to please mom or disappoint her trainers, she doesn't feel like she's got the space to figure things out, yeah. which is adding to her self-doubt, self-doubt, self-sabotage, and limited performance. Now, a lot of people are afraid to say that. Because they're afraid, oh, my God, this coach is going to get upset with me. They're going to cut my kid. Or or how dare that person say that to me? You can't tell me how to parent my kid. Well, in a way, I feel I have to because if you're coming to me and you're asking me, you're paying me to be a professional to help you, to help your child, to help, you know, at the end of the day, to help your child or help this athlete perform better, then you need to be willing to have a true assessment and a baseline of where you are, where they are, what their strengths are, kind of like a scouting report. But also let's address where the areas of improvement need to be, what the sources are, and eliminate these factors so we can try and maximize who they are. Or who it's okay. Be. It's no perfect parenting. There are no handbooks. Just like your athlete has yeah, to get reps in to get it right. Like in parenting, you also have to get reps in. And because you kind of only have one time span, you know, hearing mm. the information from somebody who has seen tons of kids is your way of getting your reps in. Like, oh, okay, well, I may need to tweak this because I've only had one rep with my one child. Yes. Um, and so it's important to just be open and be okay with going to the kid. Like, hey, I got it wrong. I didn't, I didn't oh, do it right. I think there's, um, there's so much profound beauty in that honesty. That, uh, don't be so stubborn. Right, right. Where you think, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you're crashing and burning. No. Right. I think it takes, it's a profound beauty and it shows vulnerability and it shows that we're, we're, we're all a work in progress. If you can tell your kid, you know what, my bad. Right. I'm doing my best. Yeah. And I'm going to make mistakes just like I know you are. Yes. But it, it says something if you can forgive each other, forgive the self, and come back the next day and say, let's get up and try and do it again. Let's yeah. try and do it better. I'm going to try it own today. 
make that clear runway so that they can mm. play the game. So I know you've dealt with not only the athletes and the parents. Um, talk a little bit about coaches in terms of performance. What are they actually looking for? Are they looking for just the skill itself? Because you hear a lot of like they just want the best player because they're going to get another set of players in. Are they looking for some type of like mental capacity? What are coaches actually looking for? I'll tell you what they're not looking for. They don't need any more knuckleheads. I don't. Um, you must be an extraordinarily talented player, regardless of gender, for us to ignore some of the flaw, the character flaws or traits, um, if you're going to play on this team. That's even true. That's true of any level. You know, they say coaches have favorites. And I think that's true, but it's not a personality contest. They have favorites based on the people that they believe are going to help them win a championship or win a game or put the best representative product out there. So are you putting in the time? Are you showing up on time? Are you doing the work? Are you a great teammate? Uh, do you have short-term memory for mistakes? Uh, do you have the ability to bounce back from a mistake and not show it emotionally? Um, are you consistent in your approach? There are these commandments that we can come up with that in my world, I'm, I, I guess one of the, the blessings of my field is I get to study what performance is and right. what makes a champion a champion, either as an individual or a team. What makes a coach, you know, stand out over, over their peers? And so there are obvious things that are there. And I think what people need to understand is, do you bring a passion to what you do? And are you willing to do it in spite of not wanting to do it that day? Mm -hmm. That's a separator. Um, I have, I was, as I said, I was in Orlando at, the at spring training. I'm around guys who are making millions and millions of dollars. Some of them are fighting for a livelihood, for a job, because every year you've got new young blood coming in. That's called competition. Right. You need to learn how to embrace competition, not fear it. And so if you do things out of fear, parenting out of fear, coaching out of fear, living out of fear, loving out of fear, playing a sport out of fear, you're never going to reach your potential, which is a word I, I can't stand because I think it's over overused mm -hmm. um, because very few people actually tap into their potential. So what are coaches looking for? They're looking for people who are willing to fail and learn from failure. They're looking for people who are team oriented and yet selfish because they have a drive and a desire to want to be better. It's competing. And what I love about what I do even though the title is sports psychology, it's really about life coaching because all of these life lessons in sport that the, 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 the playground of sport has allowed us to experiment with right. were transferable into our adulthood, into our relationships, into just life. And so if, if we as parents just take a step back and see the benefits, small and large, of what your kid gets from playing the sport, boy, there'd be so much less animosity between teams, right. between parents in the stands and the coaches or the umpires. Um, it, it, sh it, it would be what it needs to be, yes. an opportunity for our kids to grow. Having that balancing act of, of passion and also seeing the opportunity that's there. I love that, Jim. Mario, tell everyone where they can find you and where they can connect with you if they want to work with you. Well, you could probably find me in an airplane or an airport because <laughs> lately it's been crazy. But um, I'm known on social media as Mario Sports Doc. That's on Instagram, Twitter, uh, I think even Facebook, um, LinkedIn. Uh, I am a professor at uh, Cal Baptist University, so you can always email me there. Um, but yeah, I got a I got a pretty nice following and a profile. If anybody ever wants to get a hold of me, best way to do that is probably through social media. Send me send me a text message or a link or an email link. My website is mariosoto.com. 
M-A-R-I-O-S-O-T-O.com. And listen, if there's anything that's on my website that you can download, I have podcasts there um, and it can help you or answer some questions that can help you with whatever challenge you may have, be your coach, you're a young player trying to learn how to, how you can get better um, or a parent trying to figure this out because as you were saying, Joy, this isn't easy. You know, we have one life to try and figure this out. We as parents, regardless of however many books we've read, it, there's no real manual on how to learn how to parent our kids the right way. So we're going to, we need to learn from failure because you're going to make a lot of them and hopefully you mitigate them and you learn from them. Coaching, I would say the best takeaway for coaches, the old school way wasn't was flawed and didn't work then. So don't bring the old school rules into today because this these aren't old school kids. You need to coach them up. Right. And if you can coach them up, you're going to build trust. And when they trust you, they'll do almost anything for you. And uh, and lastly, athletes don't be afraid to fail because. How you fail and how you attack failure the next time it happens is what's going to help separate you from the average. And in my world, I'm not about average. I'm about helping people be great. So good. Thank you so much, Mario, for the assistance and support that you're giving other athletes and for your time and the gems that you dropped. I'm sure it's going to be helpful to others. Oh, Joy, my pleasure. Thank you for doing something like this. Cause I think platforms are th like this are so important. I didn't have them growing up. I'm much older than you are. And, and, you know, messaging, we need, we need, I think, educated people to come and give back so that we can raise the bar in our society so we can learn how to do things better. And I am, I try not to be a hypocrite. I try and live that motto every day. Not just as a husband, as a father, as a as a coach, as a professor, as an educator, because uh, we have a responsibility. And as I as I said the other day, if we just did one small thing to try and help one person, and we all collectively did that, the ripple effect would be a gift. And those are the things we have control of. So thank you for letting me share a little bit of that gift. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. You too.